Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, the latest edition of the Anthony Peak Consciousness Hour in Con. Now, this is a special experiment, um, and I've been discussing with a few of my associates over the last few weeks that what would be a really beautiful idea would be to um, do a live discussion, completely informal, discussing about uh, the weird and wonderful events that go around Halloween and the idea of hauntings and ghosts and everything else as well. And what we're going to do is we're going to spend the next hour and a half, two hours, discussing experiences of, of people I know, friends I know, researchers I know, and I'm hoping that what will happen, it will be a completely informal chat. Now, what I'm also hoping is that we'll get you guys involved out there in on YouTube as well with comments and any questions you may ask. Now, because Sarah isn't with me today, I'm going to have to be watching what's happening in the chat room on YouTube on another computer, which I have here. So if I'm turning around, I'm not being ill-mannered, but basically I'm just working my way through trying to juggle as many balls in the air as I possibly can. So what I'd like to do is to have, um, we got three guests in the room at the moment. We'll have other people coming in and out as time goes on. And what I'd like to do is to just have the, the three guests just quickly introduce themselves. So firstly, Emma, Emma, Emma McNeil or Emma. Can. Can. Both, both work, both work. Um, so I'm a journalist who's written about uh, uh, quirky and interesting and paranormal and strange and wonderful phenomena and um, I haven't written for a while but I still do and I do things now on online and various things so that's me. Okay now Jeremy. Yeah hi everyone I'm Jeremy I'm a bit tired today because I'm mid move so um, my brain is at half speed uh, I am a entre an entrepreneur focused on psychedelics and psychedelic healing but the reason why I'm talking today is from an early age, I've experienced supernatural phenomena. And I think what's unusual about um, my experiences is they have a certain component of veridicality. Um, they have um, <clears throat> been verified by other people. Anyway, I'm very happy to talk about that. And throughout my life, I've experienced ghosts and um, the people around me are also drawn to the supernatural. And again, there's just lots of stuff that goes on. So it's everyday life for me that there are ghosts um, and that you can communicate with them um, and so on and so forth. And of course, it's profoundly important here, Jeremy, to point out as well that you you have a PhD in philosophy as well. So you yeah. do know how to analyze information in for the sure. most precise way, which is profoundly sure. important. Both Warwick graduates, by the way. Well, we are both Warwick graduates, that is, not the royal we. Okay, and now Samantha Lee Treasure joining us up from up there in Edinburgh. Hi, uh, I'm an out-of-body experience researcher, and I, I got interested in this from childhood experiences as well. So I'm just sort of trying to um, solve the mysteries of childhood still, I guess. Childhood, that mystery period. Well, funnily enough, one of the things that... Um, Emma and I were discussing about just before was the idea of um, children and particularly Tourette syndrome, which was something we were discussing as well. And the idea of how it seems that in many ways, Tourette syndrome seems to, because I'd always thought it was just swearing, but apparently it isn't. It's actually, they pick up random thoughts and they just spout them out, which is incredible. And hopefully later on, Emma, we'll probably touch upon that. But what I'd like to talk about initially is something I know that very much, Sam, is in your area of interest, which is actually sort of non-standard hauntings, the things like, like orbs or geometric shapes, the things that are not standard ghosts, but are something that, that people see more and more. Now, the reason I'm interested in, in orbs is because I've always been quite skeptical about them. And I've always argued, you know, the standard argument, somebody takes a photograph of an orb, it, it is because of the flashlight, it's because of the way in which um, motes of um, light bounces off motes of, motes of dust in the air or also it could be lens flare. But funnily enough, Jeremy and I were talking about this a few weeks ago, and Jeremy assures me that he sees these things in three-dimensional space. And I know that Emma was mentioning that she's had those experiences as well. So Sam, can you explain a little bit about your interest and your experiences with, with, not, with orbs and non-standard? Yeah, the first thing that kind of comes to mind when you talk about orbs, I mean, um, besides the controversy around photographs and orbs being dust, is that some of the people that I've spoken to have seen orbs in one state of consciousness and then seen other beings or seen beings that look a different way in another state of consciousness, such as sleep paralysis or out-of-body experiences or dreams. 
and they don't look the same, but they still um, they still feel that it is the same being. So depending on the state of consciousness they're in, the being will have a take a certain form. So it's that's one of the I think the main things is that the uh, an orb can be a spirit. It's just it makes it it makes them travel uh, quicker. I yeah, guess. it's almost as if the, the, the orbs are using and we'll be joined later on by um, Paulino from the States, who, who, who has a very interesting theory about the link between plasma and, and ghosts and orbs as well. So this is intriguing. Now, Emma, you were about to tell me earlier on about your experience with orbs many years ago. Um, it's, it's kind of an orb, but it's also a big orb. It was the scary, the scariest thing that's ever happened to me. And I still say this, the scariest thing that's ever happened to me was I was about, must have been 19 years old. And I was staying with, in a hotel in the New Forest. And it was, well, it's a, just a, a and b in a, like a, wasn't an Airbnb because they weren't around at the time, but it was a room in a house in uh, the New Forest. And a terrible, terrible storm as well. But I closed my, closed the door to the, to the room locked it was on my own fell asleep woke up with enormous light above my bed like massive white ball orb shape above my bed first thought in my head was because that's the sort of person I am oh my goodness alien abductions exist second thought oh my god it's a ghost and then the thing moving and seeing that it was moving with intelligent feeling oh that's the sense of intelligence and that there is something literally there that is that's not just floating around it's not just a weird shape that's floating and then and then being unconscious now there's one of rational part of me that says ball lightning mm, iffy other part of me that says orb but two factors one sense of intelligence bright orb that I was then unconscious. So I, I honestly don't know, but it was absolutely terrifying. I also heard knocks before it happened. And that's a recurring thing in a lot of paranormal experiences is a knock before it happens of all sort of historically in folklore, the idea of a knock before something happens. And I did hear knocks before it happened. So again, I don't know, it was terrifying. <laughs> and I did have a headache afterwards. Again, I'm epileptic. So a headache after something, Mm, interesting is always like was it but again it didn't feel like a seizure right so now my years later and I know what a seizure feels like it wasn't a, to me it wasn't a seizure so yeah but it was it was still it was still bizarre so ball lightning mm. um I'd love to know I'd love to know if anyone else has ever had that experience I have no way now of finding until to tell my parents are both dead now but at the time I should probably at some point have said do you know what that hotel was where we stayed that one night <laughs> And again, I go just very quickly, just to stress here to anybody watching this as well, again, just to point a little bit about Emma's background. I mean, she's at Cambridge University educated scientist. So, you know, again, she's very rational and very logical in the way she approaches things. But Jeremy, you're about to say. Yeah, no. Um, sorry, I, I say, yeah, no. And a friend of mine is pointing it. Sorry, out. Oxford. Sorry, Emma. I said they said it wrong. <laughs> yeah. Oxford. Sorry. Sorry. Do it so next. it is very easy to capture what you think is an orb and it's not an orb. It could be a mote of dust lit by the, especially if you have a flash on while you're videoing with a digital camera or the phone, you can think, oh my gosh, an orb. And then the trick is if you turn your phone to the side, you'll see lots of motes of dust. No, oh, it's not an orb. Um, but it is also quite easy to capture both orbs and electronic voice phenomena. EVPs are almost everywhere. Um, I've got hundreds of examples. Um, just, to, just to segue into EVPs, so electronic voice phenomena. If you can, if, if you just use the audio record on your phone, you, you're likely to get one. Um, and they're very, very odd phenomenon because it's sort of like a sound that floats on top of the on top of the ambient sound, and it sounds electronic. It does not sound. It sounds tinny and electronic in a way. Anyway, go back to orbs. One of the things where you know that you've got a real orb is if the movement does, if it doesn't move um, like dust, um, it doesn't just kind of flow at, um, randomly. One of my orb experiences was in Nairobi and there was a whoosh of cold air. It came in through the window and then all of a sudden there were 
I think two orbs. And um, you, you know, you could say move to the right and it would move to the right, move to the left, it would move to the left. And one of the things, you know, we're talking on Halloween. One of the points I want to make is that, um, and I don't know why, but we have been conditioned layer upon layer to be scared of the spirit world and scared of the supernatural. Um, and a lot of time, I, I, well, I've, I've had so many years of experience of supernatural phenomena, so many stories that I'm no longer at all remotely afraid. Sometimes I'm annoyed because I want to sleep and it's, you know, I'm not interested in your stuff, go away. Um, but yeah, it's, I don't have that relationship of fear to the supernatural and I wish we all didn't. Um, and so the Americanization of Halloween, the pumpkins and all the costumes, I mean, it's fun for kids and let me not be a killjoy about that. But I wish for children coming up that we would we would have a different relationship with with those that are trapped in space uh, spirit. Now, my my wife is absolutely connected to the spirit world. Um, and so another point to make about orbs is there's very different types of orbs themselves. And it kind of goes to the point that Emma was making. Um, there are those that are clearly trapped in a space and can't move on to the light. And it's perfectly possible to release them um, and get rid of, get rid, you know, not get rid of them, but allow them to move into the divine source. But then there are other orbs which are much higher level, higher frequency, um, and they can move anywhere. And then they can come into presence in a space. And effectively, they are souls. And I don't have the ability to see them. And I'm not sure if you can capture them on video. But my wife, for instance, she can she can see them um, regularly. And these, yeah, these are people that um, these are souls that are not trapped in a space. They they can come into the space and presence and then they can leave. But they are a very, very high vibration. Um, <clears throat> and I, I'm not sure they're capturable on on video. Sam, what, what are your what are your thoughts on on this in terms of your experiences? My experiences with orbs. Um, I do have one experience. So I, um, around 2009 to 2012 or something, I visited Cluckley in Kent uh, probably eight or nine times. And one night I was walking through the village at, at nighttime and I was just taking random photos around. And um, when I think it was, I had to develop the photos because it was before I had a smartphone. And when it was developed, it showed um, uh, like there was a house with a wooden fence in front of it. And there was a big reddish orange orb, but it was behind like halfway behind the fence. And so I thought that's weird because that can't be, a, a, you know, a little bit of dust or something that's like this, you know, big um, red orange orb. And I didn't see anything with, with my eyes when I was taking the photo. But then a couple of years later, I was on a, a ghost hunt and we had our like coffee break in the canteen in between sessions. And I overheard somebody at my table say that um, after years and years of ghost hunting, he's only ever heard of or seen a red orb once and that was in Pluckley. Wow. So I don't know what to make of that, but um, I but think the certain places that uh, I don't know, create this kind of but, but your experiences in Puckley are extraordinary, aren't they? It's, it's not just orbs you've seen there, but geometric shapes. and. Um, yeah, I don't know if I really want to like okay. talk about it publicly right now because it's really weird. But okay. I, I, I mean, I am writing a chapter about it in my forthcoming book. Okay, but suffice to say, what we're talking about here is that that uh, that hauntings aren't necessarily just standard. I mean, I remember coming across um, a, a haunting that took place in around about 18, the 1850s, 1860s um, in, in the Tower of London. And I think it was recorded by somebody called Elliot O'Donnell, I think described it in one of his books. And in it, he describes they, 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 they were, there were two yeomen of the guard that were in there. And they suddenly there was a, 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 a again, it's fascinating what you said, Emma, you know, there was a clicking sound. And then suddenly in front of them was they described it as being like a kind of a, a, a sphere that moved into the shape of like a glass and was elongated. It had liquid inside it. 
And then something else appeared underneath it and it poured the liquid from one to the other while these guys were watching it. And when I read that, I thought this means that there's something far more strange going on here in terms of how these things are manifesting and what they really are. They're not just animate objects. They're not just ghosts of, of what we think of people. They're ghosts of fit things that are, are geometric shapes in some way. I Which think is, there's a real uh, problem that I think, I think we can all agree is that there's a bit of a problem with many of the people within our circle, within the people we work with, is that the cryptozoologists often look for the animals and the, the ufologists look for the bright shiny objects in the sky and the ghost hunters often look for the humanoid ghosts or the pulps or they might stretch to the orbs but once things go out of what they're looking for they have a kind of intentional blindness towards the things that don't fit the exact things so they're not always looking for the overlap I mean I've been reading Joshua Cutchin's books where he talks about things like the the ones there's one about smell and there's one about food which looks at all smell and how smell is important weird smells cover across cryptozoology and they come across uh UFOs and they come across all aliens and everything but I mean, this book is brilliant I'm reading it this week for other things Mystery Animals of Britain and Ireland it's a great book and of course it's in reverse because I'm on Zoom but it's got a chapter where it covers all the animals, classic cryptozoology. And then the final chapter is um, on weird shapes and weird thought forms and things. And it has things like, it doesn't have that one, but it's got like um, weird shapes and weird creatures and people have seen black shapes because they've done the book and they've got a chapter where they don't know where to put anything. Like it's not a dog, it's not a cat, <laughs> it's not a sea serpent. And they've been honest and they've included it. So I think so many things are excluded because geometric shapes, most ghost hunters don't know where to put that in the book. Mm. So they exclude it. Well, isn't it, you know, in one of my books in the hidden universe, I, I put up the concept of the egregorial, you know, the idea that in some way our reality is, 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 is influenced by our expectations of what we're likely to see. Or more importantly, whatever we are seeing will fulfill our expectations of what they are supposed to be. And we know that there's this argument in ufology, and there's absolutely no reason why it can't be applied to, to ghosts in general, that there's cultural checking going on here. You know, our expectations, we want to see fairies, we want to see goblins, these kind of things, because this is what culturally we expect. Jeremy, you, were, you want to make a point there? Yeah, no, that's that's great. Um, I enjoy, I'm enjoying this conversation. So um, my wife is Luo from Kenya, um, which is uh, an ethnic group that borders on Lake Victoria. Uh, hundreds of years ago came from the Sudan and they have an absolutely fascinating culture, collective experience culture of the supernatural which is called Nyawawa. Um, there's very little written about it, but it's it's marvelous. The Nyawawa, um, you don't know when it's going to appear, but it's the sound of animals and people chatting and talking, um, <clears throat> and it just goes past. And the idea is that the this this thing goes whatever this phenomena is, it goes back onto the lake. Um, <clears throat> And people bang pots and pans because they don't want the uh, any of the negative connotations of this collective spirit to, to come into the house. And it's just a fact of life. Oh, and your nyawawa is coming, get your pots and pans. Um, and unfortunately, it's never been recorded. I'd, I'd love to, I'd love to record it. But um, here in Cheshire, we we we've had that a few times. Um, the sound of animals cows and sheep i mean i'm in a rural area but very loud sound of <laughs> animals and they are not around you know i know when the sheep are in the field nearby or the cows um and it's it's most odd so yeah i mean from a global perspective there's probably hundreds of different phenomena which are not have not got this um western individualistic aspect to it it's just part of the cultural embeddedness of the place and again it's it's not mythological or we shouldn't we shouldn't be kind of paternalistically patronizing about what this is there's something there which is of the real 
which is manifested and experienced collectively. Um, but is it actually real? I mean, you know, literally, is it real or is it embedded somehow in the consciousness? It's a bit like the uh, the story of the kids in Zimbabwe that you know had the encounter with the with the the craft. Did it really land? Was it really there? Or was it something that, um, you know, interdimensionally got embedded into conscious experience? And I think this is the thing, this is the thing that um, the, 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 the ontological status of the supernatural and whether there is a purely physical, you know, it's cashed out in physical terms or if it's somehow projected into consciousness, interdimensionally, who, who knows? But Nyawawa in, in Kenya seems, to, and my experience of animal sounds nearby seems to be i'm not sure that there's a physical you know a pure physical like ontological reality to it and it's more like it's somehow projected into i've got hundreds of stories not hundreds but tens of stories along this lines um, i think we can leap into those later because that's going to be yeah. fascinating sam as a as a postgraduate anthropologist at the moment in terms of your work are you coming across a lot of this you know the cultural by the cultural biases involved in the phenomenon that we we include because we we look at it in a very Western way. Yeah. Uh, yeah, um, definitely. I think a lot of times, if there's nothing in the culture to explain what you've experienced, um, sometimes that's it depends on the person's personality too. And there's so much diversity like within cultures, especially now with um, internet access as well and globalization. So there's a lot of overlap. But um, yeah, I definitely see that some some people will just ignore something that happens to them I've done that myself too I don't know where exactly to fit it so I'll just put it in the back of my mind and try to forget about it um but yeah then there's some people have more of a very curious personality and they really have to know and they might search for something online or in other cultures to try and explain what they've experienced as well. I think that's a trend that we're seeing more of probably that people are now able to search for things um, in different cultures and, you know, uh, make friends, even if it's online with people from different cultures that have a similar experience and try to work out what it is together. Well, here's almost the argument, isn't it? You know, we're going back to something I've mentioned many times in these discussions, you know, the Saper Wolf hypothesis and the idea that the external world is somehow molded by our expectations of it. And of course, the, 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 the weak Saper Wolf hypothesis argues that it's to do with language and how we describe the world is the world we use, the words we use are the words that embed ourselves in our understanding of the external world, particularly say grammatical forms and how we use grammar you know, and the idea of, you know, how verbs change depending upon circumstances. But then this then becomes intriguing, doesn't it? Because I'd argue that it's more to do with our interpretation of a phenomenon that is seemingly independent of us, that seems to come through under certain unique circumstances, when we seem to be attuned in some way to it. And it, it realises that we are attuned to it. And it takes the opportunity to come through when that happens. Um, and I know, Emma, the work you've done and the writings, when I first came across your work was that wonderful article you wrote on other, on other kin um, in 14 Times many years ago. But I know that this is an area that interests you as well, isn't it? Yeah, the sort of social, well, other kin, other kin's taken off since I wrote that article. I feel kind of weird about it. You know, I came, ac I came across the concept of other kin. I was reading an article on social anthropology only a couple of days ago, mm -hmm. and the word other kin came up. And I, I and it leapt out the page, and I thought, wow, you know. The thing is, I, I, before I wrote the one for 14 times, about four years before I wrote that, I wrote an article for it for like a women's magazine, and um, for Soul and Spirit or something like that. And then years later, I was seeing people say online, you know, <laughs> other kin article for 10 times saying, I didn't know I was other kin until I read an article in Soul and Spirit. And I was like, okay, what have I done? <laughs> <laughs> so can you explain a little bit about the concept of, of, of how the well, it's people, it's, it, 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's a valid idea. It's people who believe that their um, inner being is aligned to it's a little bit like the spirit animal idea but not quite it's the idea that their inner being is their soul is that of a animal now in other kin it's that that 
animal is a mythical animal. So for other kin, it's other rather than being a, um, a real animal. So a therian would be, it's a real animal. So a wolf or a fox or a whatever. You tend to be a predator, interestingly. Whereas an other kin, it's an otherworldly animal, like an, or a creature, like an elf or a werewolf or a, a unicorn or something. And then that's that they identify. But then it gets complicated because then it becomes all about um, all sorts of other ideas like saying that they are, it's an interdimensional thing, like their soul swapping and soul bonding and all sorts of other ideas come in, like ideas about having come from soul swapped from another dimension or all sorts of other ideas. So sometimes it's at absolute purest. It is actually quite a lovely idea. The idea that your inner soul is more, uh, more closely matches that of whatever and that's but then you get some then it becomes slightly strange then the idea of multiverses gets brought in by some people that it's that the universe with which you more closely align is that of one where unicorns would be closer then there's the other one people where who they then that then there's also now fiction kin where people believe that their soul is that of a fictional character and then just to make it even more complicated, it's now very much part of the um, multiple, what used to be multiple personality, but is now multiples. And so it's a uh, dissociative identity, the ID, which is also people who believe that they are endogenic, as in the, the, the multiple personalities have formed from within, not just from trauma. Mm -hmm. So it's become even more complicated since then. So it's it's become, or the idea that you can have, personality can come from without. It has, the, as a concept, the whole concept of personality has changed in the, I wrote that article, what, 10 years ago now, roughly? In that 10 years, I would, even trying to think and get all that straight in my head without a diagram <laughs> in front of me, I struggled. I would have to start from the beginning if I was gonna even begin to try and write an article on it now. It's, um... It's, it's very interesting. Um, God, you said you said so much there that fire, fires things off. So going back to what we were talking about at the beginning, me mental illness and um, the supernatural. I have uh, some psychiatrist pals um, who are, you know, progressively minded and open to the fact, to the idea that some forms of mental illness are not just brain generated. I mean, okay, a lot of mental illness is from my perspective to do with being marginalized, being poor, you know, being from an, uh, an othered group. Um, and in those situations, you may well not feel at home in your, in your body, right? So that's, that's one thing. Secondly, there could be, I, do, I really don't believe in a, a chemical imbalance theory of depression or anything like that. Um, and I think that's largely being dis disproven as we speak. But then there is another type of mental illness, which is that you are being plagued by um, attachments, entity attachments. And as someone who's very interested in psychedelics, there's a real risk of this happening. Um, if you take psychedelics and you know, you're, you're neuro neuroplastically opened to the world and, and potentially other frequencies, um, uh, you you are at risk if the space is not being held properly um, and people can become mentally ill because of that experience um, and uh, yeah so going back to psychiatrist friends of mine they would say look there are two types of schizophrenia there is the schizophrenia which is somehow physiological somehow maybe genetic, but we don't know what, but it has a, a kind of rational, we have the terms for explaining what it is, but then there are types of schizophrenia where you're simply not um, able to filter out what's an internal voice from, from an external voice. Um, and that might well be that uh, it could be an entity attachment thing, or it could be that there's just some state of disequilibrium between that the boundary condition of being here and, and, and what's going on, you know, beyond that. 
Now, um, another point to make, which is quite a scary one and maybe a good Halloween thought, but I do believe it's possible to leave your body and not come back for a while and some other spirit can go into your body. And I, have, it, I haven't had that experience myself that I know about. Maybe it happens. Um, I mean, think about sometimes you don't feel yourself or you don't feel in sync with yourself. You don't feel centered in yourself. And then suddenly you lock back in. Anyway, a story from South Africa, a, a, a young shaman friend of mine, she said that she was away out of her body for about four days. And she met the person who took her place and went into her body and they were communicating. And she said for the person that was uh, holding fort in her body, it was very strange because she suddenly had all of these somatic memories and, um, but she didn't know what to do, do with them. And then my friend came back into her body. And I think this is just an experience that um, it's probably, it's a bit like alien abductions. It's probably far more prevalent. It's just simply to go back to Sapir Wharf. It's, it's not within our language to talk about this in our culture. But I think if we open up to the possibility, it may well be that um, one, we leave our body, two, other people come into our body or other beings, or it might be that our spirit actually has different locations and different dimensions to it. Um, and is really really weird like so far apart from a cartesian individualized rationalistic concept of, of self we used and to be able to. the final point which is just because anthony will want some more science to come in here there's some very interesting work that i've just heard up about this guy david levin and it is the idea that dna does not do all the organizing in an organism um, so if you have a salamander that has its leg cut off, how on earth does it have its leg? How does the leg grow back with the fingers? Um, and apparently genetics cannot do that. Something, there's another, there's a higher level organizing principle at work. David Levin is pioneering the idea of bioelectricity. So there's an organizing bioelectric field, which sits somehow, and don't ask me, difficult questions because I know the superficies of this thing but for me this is finally starting to be a paradigm for explaining a lot of these things that there is a bioelectric field which may equate in some way to an astral body or some kind of I don't know if it's piezoelectric but there's something which can come into a body and come out of a body and has some kind of organizing power. But we're at the very early stages of understanding this. These. This is really quite fascinating because somebody that um, I was in, by the way, uh, Chris Romer has just joined us as well. Chris, we'll join you in a second. We just want to, 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 to get a little bit on this point because it's quite fascinating where we're going with this. Um, I met a few years ago, um, uh, Professor John Joe McFadden of Surrey University. And John Joe is one of the world's leading authorities in, in um, quantum biology. And he, he wrote a book a few months, about two years ago, I think, with uh, Jim Al-Khalili, the, uh, the, the physicist. And they are very good friends. And I was hoping one day to have a wonderful meeting with Jim Al-Khalili and Joe Joe McFadden, because that would be, oh, that would just be awesome. But um, both of them are coming along the lines of the same kind of principles, the idea that there is something electrical in the sense that it would explain things like only last night I was discussing with my father-in-law about phantom limb syndrome because he was explaining to somebody he knew who had lost her leg in an accident and she could still feel the leg and she could feel the irritations as if it was physically there. And is this because there is a kind of a, a kind of a pattern that we that we that the flesh fills in? But when the flesh disappears, those patterns are still there, which is then the astral body. Now, very quickly, I just want to make another point about your point and a very important one about the idea of, 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 of replacing somebody within their own body. And I'm reminded here of the, the, the case of I there, which was cited by the out of body guy, Robert Monroe in his book, Journeys Out of the Body, because in that he describes how he would go into an out of body state and he would find himself in another location completely inside somebody else's body, like a drop in. Now, again, we can bring in the idea of drop ins 
from from spiritualism and from mediumship where mediums are talking and suddenly a drop in appears and the the original communication ceases and some other entity comes in and gives information and again i'm reminded here of the classic case of the icelandic a medium called indridder indridderson and that's an extraordinary case um, recorded by professor haroldson and but I, I can't go off on that or maybe we'll go back into that later because I don't want to be talking for too long. But what is important here is that um, uh, with um, Robert Monroe, when he was in this state, he would literally drop into this other person's body in this other version of Earth. And, and on occasions he would come in and he would manifest in the guy's body. And there was one time where he came into the guy's body and he was in a business meeting in his house. So either was in a business meeting, suddenly loses consciousness. Robert Munro's in his body and he's halfway through a conversation and a business deal. And these, he doesn't know what to say. And either's wife is looking at him, looking at him completely puzzled. Why aren't you saying what you're supposed to say? Now, immediately when I read that, I was immediately thinking of temporal lobe epilepsy and absence seizures. And, you know, when somebody has an absence seizure, they seem to just go. And could it be that when somebody has an absence seizure, that's the opportunity for another consciousness to kind of literally drop in for a time and then disappear again? And Emma, I know that, you know, with your experiences with TLE, you know, I mean, does this ring bells with you? Well, the, abs the definition of an absence seizure... Is you're not there. <laughs> no, 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 because absence means... The reason it's called an absence is because you look like you're not there. Yeah. Whereas so when you have an absence seizure, you, you are still consciously aware. It's just you, that you look like you've gone somewhere else. No, you, it depends. You, you, well, for me, it's not. It's called, you see, that's why they call them partial seizures now, not absence mm, seizures. Okay. Because you look, but it means like, so uh, grandma, so you call them grandma, it's because the whole brain is shut down completely. It's, brain goes completely partial seizure it's because a little bit goes at a time not your whole brain and that's an absence seizure is usually that because a bit of the brain goes so it's like that it's like switch off tiny bits gone off mm -hmm. so but most of the brain's still working but the reason it's you can't see it is because a small amount of it has switched off complex partial is more than one bit has switched off but not the whole bit which is why you haven't gone down Right. Complex partials are the ones we associate with strange phenomena because it's complex partial. It's affecting multiple different bits, which is why you're getting wacky things happening to your brain because it's going from different parts. So it's triggering anxiety. It's triggering speech. It's triggering smell. It's doing all sorts of different things. So for me, it's triggering smell. It's triggering anxiety and it's triggering memory, say those three right. things. And that would be a common combination. So that's why that's complex. That's why they changed the language because absence does make it seem like you're gone. For me, I can, for some of it, I can't move, can't speak. I think it's been 20, 30 seconds, but Anthony will tell me it's gone on longer. Yes. Is so the I will, dilation effect? Yeah that is extraordinary and so when I come I, out of it as far as I'm concerned I'll be I, I'll be going I want to speak I want to speak I want to speak and when it's come out of it Anthony will go I'll say how long did that take and he'll say mm, quite a long time wow. <laughs> quite a while you've gone quite a while but for me it's felt like 30 seconds a minute you know but he says no it's about two minutes maybe but yeah but you're not gone so it's it's it's, you have, it's not a total thing. I I the reason I say this is the only time I've ever actually witnessed precognition happening was a friend of mine who experiences temporal lobe epilepsy, and she went into a partial seizure. I'm not using the old terminology, but she went blank mm. and was was looking in the distance, and she she then said something, and something occurred. I've, I've told this story many times. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just time to talk about it now. But she then said something which then when she came out of the absence seizure, she said again, which was triggered by an event that she was witnessing. And that meant that she had perceived the immediate future of his, her own environment. And I witnessed that. And I thought that was extraordinary. But just very quickly, just 
Chris, are you are you with us now and everything else? Are you well? I am. I am. Oh, can you hear me? Okay. We can yeah. indeed. We can Hang indeed. On. Turn the um, camera on. Wonderful. Okay, Chris, can you just very quickly introduce yourself and then we'll give you a catch up as to where we've been. Uh, Hi, sorry about that. I was having a few problems joining the call for some reason. I'm CJ. I'm the chair of ASAP, the Association of Scientific Study of Anomalous Phenomena. And I know very little about epilepsy, so I will be very quiet for a few moments. <laughs> OK, very fine. And very much just when we were talking there about the out of body state and the circumstances. Um, Sam, would you like to come in there with any comments yourself there in regard to that? Yeah, yeah. So I've spent, I spent probably about uh, almost 10 years in the sort of OBE community, especially in London, people who want to have OBEs and people who do have them and are looking for, um, you know, explanations for them like myself. And one trend I've seen a lot of is people saying, um, that's one natural fear that we have is, well, you know, the soul goes in the body, right? If your soul comes out of the body, can't another soul come in and take its place? And a lot of people ask that question. And recently we're seeing a lot more commodification of OBEs. So people selling courses of how to do it. And so um, they have an agenda to make the OBE sound as safe and as beneficial as possible. So I'm hearing a lot of people in the kind of new age Western circuit uh, spiritual marketplace say, oh no, it's fine. No, of course that can't happen. But I mean, how would you know? Because if somebody, if you couldn't get back to your body, how would you ever know? How would somebody know? How can you prove it? So how can you say that it's impossible? And in many different cultures, they do have this fear that you can be possessed. Um, I mean, in, in shamanic cultures, some of them have institutionalized possession trance, some of them institutionalize um, out of body experience or journey trance, and some uh, have both kinds of trance. And there are a lot of overlap between them, which is um, something that I'm planning to look into a lot more in the coming year. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I've definitely heard stories which make me very open minded about it. We just don't know. Yeah, because Jeremy, and like you said, with mediumship, like you mentioned, Tony, with mediumship, I mean, if you say that nothing can come into your body, then you're also not only are you negating what people in many cultures believe, but you're also negating what a lot of mediums believe here mm -hmm. as well. Well, 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 one of the, I mean, that case I mentioned earlier on, the Indridder Indridderson, was really quite fascinating because Indridder Indridderson, it was around about 1904, and Indridder Indridderson was an incredibly famous um, medium in, Hels in, in, in Reykjavik. And he was doing a normal session with, with, on a Friday night, I think it was, he was doing a normal session, and he had the normal people coming through and the normal spirits coming through that you'd expect in a normal medium, trans, medium transmission. And then suddenly he stopped, and suddenly this, like another transmission came in, and he starts describing, and it's somebody else talking, and the somebody else was talking in Danish. Now, Indridison was actually speaking in, in Icelandic, because at that time, Iceland, Iceland and Denmark were part of the same country. So, so suddenly he starts speaking in, in, in Danish and, and a Copen, Copenhagen accent, okay? And he, he's saying, and he turns around and he says, there's a fire going on across the street from where I am. Um, it's really quite exciting. And, and the fire engines are trying to turn up and they're trying to put the fire out. And the entity described himself and he gave himself a name. And he said, yes, this is my name. Um, and I live on, on uh, Christian's, Chris, uh, um, Chris Königstrasse in, in, Den, in, in, in Copenhagen. And then he said, but I've got to go now because it's getting more exciting. I'll come back to you later. And then Indridison goes back, comes to, and he said, what happened? And they said, well, somebody dropped in, gave a description of a fire in Copenhagen, gave their location uh, and said they were gonna go away and they'll come back later. So they continue with the, the, the transmediumship. And then about three or four layers later, it suddenly comes back in again. And this guy again said, just to give you an update, yeah, they've calmed the fire down now and it's all okay and everything else. And that was it. And then he went. Now, the interesting thing was, was that in those days, Iceland was far away from, in terms of communications, there were no telephone lines or anything. The only yeah. news that came from, from Denmark was by newspapers. And they were always three or four days behind because they came over on steamers. 
And the newspapers came, you know, for that evening, three or four days later, describing the fire taking place in Königstrasse in Copenhagen. So whatever the entity was, it was watching and it was aware and it was describing a real event that was taking place. But the weird story then is that um, in, uh, um, under Haraldson, who was the professor of psychiatry, psychology at the University of Iceland, did some research on this about 10 years ago. And he went back to the records and he discovered the name of the guy and the guy that was describing it. And the creepy thing was the guy used to live in the address he described where he could see the fire, but he'd already died. He'd been dead a few weeks. So then it was again what the point Jeremy was saying about spirits not moving on because they feel trapped. But then there's the new argument that the spirit, that this particular spirit was trapped in a time zone, watching the events that were gonna happen after he had died, and then drops in randomly into a medium's mind, what, four, five, six, seven hundred miles away in, a, in, in another part of the same country. All very intriguing, isn't it? Um, Chris, would you like to join in here a little bit on that one, just to draw you into the conversation? Yeah, I mean, Indridi had some peculiar experiences before then, including um, he channels on one occasion, quite famously, uh, somebody who didn't like him very much and who he had fallen out with. And one of the things, though, about Icelandic culture of that time is that they would obviously understand Danish. Mm. I mean, even now they are mutually intelligible, but Icelandic is like listening to somebody talking from a thousand years ago because they've diverged to that extent. So the, the, the alphabets are different. The pronunciations are completely different, but there is there are some concepts in common. But the other thing is that many of the newspapers in uh, of the time were published in Danish and my own family. I had family in Iceland and family in Denmark, and obviously they went backwards and forwards. So, yeah, I mean, it's a very he was a very famous medium and Orlando went on to do a huge amount of work. Orlando worked on um, modern death coincidences and death experiences in Iceland. And I think his book is one of the most compelling cases for the reality of some kind of after death communication. I can't remember the title, but it's Elanda Haraldson. And it really is worth looking up. Um, I put it on my shelf, but I'm trying to look and I'm not seeing it because I'm not wearing my glasses. So, but definitely worth looking up. Yeah. Yeah, Haraldson's work was extraordinary. And funnily enough, you might be interested to know that Erlander Haraldson was with my associates, um, Dr. Prokol and Dr. Winkler, the guys that invented the lucid light device. He was with them when they went over to, um, to Lhasa in Tibet. Um, oh, okay. to test, right. test the light in Lhasa. Yeah, so it was quite extraordinary. And I'd always wanted to meet him because I always found his work extraordinary really really extraordinary now the reason we're talking about this chris is that jeremy was discussing the idea again of drop-ins and of, of of entities coming in to people yeah. like taking them over in certain ways maybe jeremy you'd like to just mention a little bit more about that so chris is aware of that yeah um i wanted to not not plug but there's a fantastic uh, drama series it should still be on netflix called behind her eyes Oh. And I don't want to say too much about it, but it is absolutely brilliantly done and no one talks about it enough, but it is about going out of body and an, another soul and swapping. And Oh, I've seen that. I know the one you mean. Yeah, it's well, really, well, really, really the, the, well done. One of the people behind that is a mutual friend of Sam and I's. Ah, right. Okay. Um, yeah. So, uh, you, know, philosoph you know, philosophically, if we assume that consciousness is not generated by the brain it's some kind of field phenomenon that we tap into and if at a deeper level metaphysically we question the idea that ultimate reality is somehow material then everything becomes up for grabs in a way and um you know in a way we're still locked into a cartesian metaphysically material paradigm because if you pull the rug from that well we don't have a language in our culture to you know there's a fear response so we have to keep tipping back it's fascinating to watch you know the the u.s government opening up of the idea of disclosure 
with you know the kind of normalization or mainstreamization of uaps within the military industrial complex so it sort of feels like we're teetering on a kind of a quantum change of understanding the framework of ultimate reality and in in my life it's coming in from all different directions all at once so there's a um, friend of mine in australia who uh is quite frank that he's not terrestrial you know he's he's come from a different star system and he's come he's come here just to check it out this earth this earth system a lot of people when they die they just seem to just disappear and some people hang around and they may not be trapped in space but they're still you can still communicate with them in one way or another but some people star people absolutely disappear the, the final thing i wanted to say was to, to samantha which is yeah, the commodification of OBE training and so on, it is fraught with risk because you don't you don't really know what's happening when you're in that state and you need to be with someone. You shouldn't do it just ideally. You shouldn't really do it on your own. It's, it's very similar to psychedelics. You need to be really, really careful with with what's going on and um, know that you're you're safe and protected in a certain way. Just the final thing, you know, on Halloween where i'm leaving and i'm mid move and i'm going to drop off the call in a minute but there is a portal in this bloody house yeah, please tell us about this you've talked to me about oh, it. please so We've got the guys sorry, here sorry, can yeah. I do so, I so go um, um halloween guests have just arrived so okay. i have to drop off the call okay first. sam great to join us thank you thank very you much, much. You. Thank you. happy See halloween bye. Thank you. bye so the people that are in my world uh, in touch with the spirit world are not show people they're not in the media they don't talk about it they just do it and there's just a, a very ordinary person who has remarkable gifts of knowing if there's spirits around and she came to this house which is a 70s house so it shouldn't have spirits in but it's full of them and um Oh, there's lots of different stories but just to simplify it she got rid of a few of them and then she said there's a portal in one of the rooms somebody has done a ouija board session and they've opened it up um and 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 this friend of ours she doesn't know how to close a portal it's a really complicated you need to be very experienced at closing them and so <sighs> this is where i don't know what it is but um I've been sleeping in that room. Sometimes there's something like ectoplasm, which has a really disgusting smell. It's like rotten plastic, vegetation. Ugh. And um, yeah, I'm not scared of it. It's just annoying because somehow it's like, uh, what's it called? Stranger Things. It's really like that. It's just some kind of physical gooey yuck thing that you can drift through. And um, my wife was in the shower the other day and the door to the, the bathroom, you have to really pull it. <clears throat> and the door opened wide. And at the same time, the friend who told us that there's a portal in the house, she said she knew that something had come through, some particularly malevolent, malevolent energy had come through at the moment that the door was being opened and she immediately got um, Archangel Gabriel. I think it was Gabriel or was it Michael? Anyway, one of the archangels to come in and sort it out. So it is that this is the Halloween spookiness of it. Yeah, well, you don't know what comes through portals, how many portals there are. I used before I was living in here, I was living in Rwanda in Kigali where there's hundreds of thousands of trapped spirits. And um, I, I found out that where we were living, our garden was a mass grave and we didn't know about it. Um, and just, there were so many orbs, it was nuts, um, just popping in and drifting around. And sometimes I'd catch a f sort of disembodied feet walking upstairs and so on. So yeah, yeah. so this, this I, I'm not personally afraid of the supernatural, but um, as with my work with psychedelics, you do have to be very careful and have people that know how to keep a space pure and contained and full of loving light and so on, because there are kind of all kinds of random, maybe they were human, maybe they were never human. 
you know, this is maybe why there can be, you know, geometric sh shapes and, um, but you have to be careful with this stuff. And for me, where we should move to is celebrating people have the power to keep spaces pure and, con and contained because the more we're moving in the direction of being able to talk about it and our culture is in step with that, the more we're going to have to have people that are trained to, to yeah, protect us. Um, because, uh, you know, as Paul Levy says, the, the wetico spirit, the, 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 the spirit which is conjured out of nothing through collective consciousness, which becomes viral and can lead us astray into all kinds of viral madness, well, that can seep in through portals and whatnot. Thank you for that. And just as to make a point, if anybody's watching this, either the recording or the real show as well, um, is that Paul Levy is a, has been a previous guest on this show and we, we spent an hour, an hour and a half discussing Wetico and the concepts. Also, um, Jade, um, the, one of the ladies behind, behind her eyes, she's also been a guest on this show as well. So, you know, we, 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 we know a lot of these people in the kind of the world, the world view at the moment. I'm really interested in, 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 in Chris's opinions on this. Um, oh, you must go. Yes, cause because you're moving house. Wonderful, Jeremy. Um, fantastic. Thanks for your involvement. Thank and then you. there were three. Then there were three. Chris, so your thoughts on this? Uh, on the question of possession and obsession and... Uh, yes, what that yes, because of course you'll have been involved in it and, and ghosts as uh, well because of your experiences in, was it Bury St Edmunds, I think, as well? Yeah, in Thetford. Okay, yeah. Uh, I'm just trying to make the light a bit brighter. Alexa, can you make the light bright, please? It looks like you're talking to spirits because you've got your... Yeah, it does. I was just trying to... Uh, never mind. I seem to be very blue tonight, but never mind. Okay, um, let's start at the beginning then. So the first and fundamental question we've got to ask is who or what are we? I mean, I know that's a strange place to start, but what when you say the self, what do you mean by the self? Because my working model of uh, these matters is that consciousness is non-local, that our consciousness exists outside of the body. But if that is the case, then we are, our bodies are essentially a, a receiver for a signal that is broadcast. And when the body ends, the signal may well continue. I would hope it does. So the song goes on forever. The question then is, is that what we normally mean when we talk about self? And when I talk about self, I'm talking about a balding old fat Dane with not much hair, what he has got needs cutting, which is why I've got the hat rammed on tonight, um, who looks out at the world and is having the conversation with you now. So I think about my body as being an integral part of myself. So how, what, what do you see as being the self? How do you define that? That's a question to you, Anthony, and to Emma. How would I define the self? I would say it's it's probably you define yourself by your collection of memories. Um, right. OK, so that's a really important point. So if the self is defined by a sense of history, by a sense of memory and a, and a narrative that takes it from the beginning to what you are now, are you the same person that you were 10 years ago? That's an interesting point. Am I physiologically the same person? You do hear about the idea, you know, that cells replace themselves at that time, both brain cells as well. But I would argue that, no, that I'm transitory. And I very much take the 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 Hindu concept of the Linga Surya, you know, the idea of the long body through time and space. And again, you know, my, my favourite, uh, and somebody I've written a book on, uh, J.B. Priestley said, or had one of his characters say in um, his play Time and the Conways, that that we are all ourselves we are a long body and we are all ourselves and any moment we are a cross cross section of that person at that time and we just evolve through various things so that's a very intriguing point emma would you like to come in here on on just on that and then christian yourself the i know my limits yeah. <laughs> yeah. honestly do um yeah i know my limits on that no no i'm not going to try and define myself in any anyway but uh yeah i do i do like the I, I i think that for me that is just my biggest challenge though as a person it's where is mm. where is the, the 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 whole soul body yeah and stuff. that's my biggest challenge as a person as a scientist right? that's that my the problem that is the problem for science, isn't it? We we don't use the metaphysical soul because the soul or the Atman or the the integral self, the the thing that is us forever, is what we can't define scientifically as well. And it's why we have such problems with trying to talk about 
So say, for example, that I go outside in a moment, I'm walking down the street and the chimney pot falls down, and hits me on the head. And by sheer fluke of luck, I managed to survive. I don't know if you could call it luck, having a chimney pot land on my head, but many might consider it so. And so I survived that experience, but my memory has gone and I can no longer remember the first thing about who I was or what I was. So I'm brought home and presented with some cats and a house and some friends who come around and tell me about who I was. But I now have to sort of try and forge myself again. And I become a very different person. My personality changes following the accident. And I still don't have any memory of being CJ. Am I still me? Has the self survived? Then that, that's the, the that's extraordinary, isn't it? The idea of, are you still you? Physiologically, you are. But if, as we probably both agree, that consciousness, the brain is a receiver of consciousness, there would be an argument to say that the, the physical body can no, has lost its ability to take that particular signal in. Mm -hmm. And it's developing without that signal. It doesn't mean the signal is still not there. Because um, it's, it's a fascinating idea, isn't it? If I forget everything that I've ever experienced, you know, using my memory analogy, how, am I me anymore? Because my whole life narrative has ceased. Is it your and I have to learn again. But using the quote as Asimov, you know, death is when you exist only in the memories of others. Is it your memories or other people's memories of you that are, are your existence? very interesting point isn't it yeah that we use other people to define who we are so you know it's not doesn't matter what you, it's only if you exist in the memories of others that you exist yeah you know if a tree falls in the forest and there's nowhere there to listen if an Anthony yeah. thinks and there isn't anyone to think about this <laughs> maybe we exist only in the memory of god and maybe that's why i'm so always come back to christianity because the notion of an eternal observer who understands and remembers us would allow for immortality in a way that okay this either keeps the quad going let's go away from christian theology and go to star trek then so we you come up to the starship enterprise and we decide we're going to fly over and visit emma and while we are hovering somewhere above um the beautiful north of Ireland, we, we decide to, you're going to beam down to Emma's, yeah? So you know how Star Trek dis, uh, transporters work. We disintegrate you down into your component atoms. The signal, the information is then beamed down to the surface and you are reassembled there from a locally available matter. So not one atom is the same. Are you still the same person? Well, this is coming down then to the big question of the substrate problem, isn't it? And the idea, if you, for argument's sake, if you could download, if you could do a digital copy of somebody yep. literally down to the quantum level and then yep. reproduce that digital copy inside a computer, have you recreated the person or not? And I think this comes back, doesn't it, to um, John, oh, the, uh, the English theologian, who has this, um, this copy theory of immortality and the idea, you know, that you, you, you can be recopied and you can continue. But the question is, does your essence continue within that teleportation? And I think, you know, as I think the point you're making here, isn't it? One of the big problems here is, you know, if we have teleportation, if we have non-locality, if we have the EPR paradox, if we have uh, superposition and everything else, are you the same? And what would happen, indeed, if you recreated two versions of that download? At the same time. At the yeah. same time. Which one is yeah. which one? Well, and we already do on a regular basis in the form of twins. Identical twins yes, have yes. the same genetic material. And so, therefore, they have the same brain structure. And so, until they start to have different experiences, we would expect them to receive the same signal. So therefore, are they one individual sharing two signals and therefore should we only classify them for the purpose of the vote as having one vote? <laughs> should we only give them one credit rating? You know, where are the limits of personhood? If it's not going to be physical, then you could suddenly start arguing that twins are the same individual, which I'm sure most twins would be deeply outraged by. I think it's a very valid point. And it's something, again, the point we're making here, I think, is a really interesting one because we all naturally assume that our ego is ourselves and, and we define ourselves through our ego and our, our identification as being, having your name, you know, and your name is something that belongs to you. 
But as you rightly say, we are different people throughout periods of our lives. You know, we are, we think differently and we look different. I mean, it's one of the things I find as I get older, you know, I, you know, it's that weird feeling, isn't it? Sometimes you catch your reflection in the mirror. And when you catch your reflection in the mirror, when you see yourself as the reflection is, rather than that super, super position you put all over it of who you expect yourself to be, and you realize you're growing old and you're changing and you're different. So what is continual about the essence of what we are? And I think it's, it's an intriguing point. And I, I'm, fa I'm really delighted now the way this has really gone on to an incredibly different level of intellectual discussion here in terms of what we are. Emma, again, drawing you in. Um, no, I was just thinking, I was just thinking about that. I was thinking for, for me, it's, it's, for me, it's much less when I think about myself developing. I always think much more about how I've changed brain wise. Like I think more about how I've changed my opinions on things, which is related to that. So again, it's the brain changing and feeling that I'm a very different person. You know, and I was thinking that today. Mm -hmm. I have a list of things I've changed my opinion on dramatically. Um, and I'll never tell people what they are, like my list of 10 things I've changed my opinion 180 degrees on. <laughs> yeah, it'd, it'd always be terribly embarrassing then because you know, the people would say, well, I told you so. <laughs> exactly, so I'm not going to tell people what they are. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I think that, yes, it's it's this. But can we ever know any of this? That's the awful thing is we can talk about it. We can't ever know. When I was a teenager, I had no idea who I was, but somewhere on that, back in that time, I came across um, John Hick, the theologian. I John Hick people... is the person I was talking about earlier. Yeah, thank you. Oh, okay. I wasn't here for that, but I read God. Yeah, I, I cite John Hick extensively in my new book. I like Hick. I, I found Hick fascinating. I got to eventually see him debating with Anthony Flew, the great agnostic philosopher. Wow. Interesting. And Flew's, I mean, I was only a teen, so I didn't understand a lot of it, but Flew's argument at the time was that when we die, if we don't have the same body, we're not us, that we, there is something about our body which is so profoundly related to our concept of self that you cannot have. And therefore, you know, he argued from the line that there is no uh, marriage in heaven, there's no male or female, that again, if we were sexless, we lost a, a very important part of who we are. And so that lead, that led to the question of what is actually us, and that leads to that old tripartite Pauline theology of body, mind, and spirit, and which part is which, and what do we actually mean when we talk about being ourselves? But those <laughs> questions, are, these are questions that suddenly become really important when you start to deal with the idea of possession, mm -hmm. because does possession have to be all or nothing? Do, does my head need to spin round? Do I need to regurgitate pea soup? And do I suddenly start to talk, need to start talking in a Liverpudlian accent and smoking clove cigarettes and summoning demons? No. Um, you know, you can still be you without those kind of... But then to Crowley and others in the Western magical tradition, there was always this concept of obsession. And obsession is... Possession is, if you like, a total takeover of personality and of consciousness, the, the, the will, the agency has gone. There is no longer, I am no longer CJ. I am instead, oh, there is only Zool. Isn't that the line from Ghostbusters? There is no Dana, there is only Zool. Yeah, that's possession. But obsession is much more subtle. Obsession is closer to those kind of personality changes we find in some organ transplant donors, which are where it's claimed that the recipient of the transplant starts to take on attributes from the former host and it's sometimes put down to cellular memory and there's a lot of really interesting scientific stuff going on in that field um maybe it will turn out to be nonsense but at the moment it seems to be holding up and of course it's always difficult because after something as traumatic as a transplant operation you would expect personality changes anyway you would expect mm. there to be alterations a high dose of steroids as well yeah so it's high dose of steroids are quite major and suddenly being able to do stuff that you've not been able to do for absolutely and a whole new chance at life it's going to give you a whole new set of philosophical attitudes anyway so if you suddenly start hanging out with teenage girls riding a motorbike and be eating hot dogs or whatever it is that your family claim was an attribute of the host that could be down to those reasons but it is fascinating to me because i've the notion of who am I, what are we, 
and to what extent are we autonomous is just one that I've played with throughout my whole ghost hunting career. Can a ghost affect you on an emotional level? Could a haunting actually play out not through objects floating around the room and banging doors and ghastly apparitions, but actually be playing out at a much more subtle the Exning Brothel story is one I always come back to, which was there was a house that in the early 19th century in Exning in Suffolk had been a brothel and um, it was closed down eventually. And the parish <laughs> was very glad to see the back of it. And, you know, but a number of women had been very unhappy there. And thereafter, the story went that it was haunted and uh, everybody who moved into it, their marriages broke up very soon after and they split up. Now, actually, statistically, that's quite likely, because when you first marry and move into a house together, that is the most likely period, the next 18 months or so, as you're adapting to actually the reality of living with one another, when you're most likely to break up. So, or what that was when I was young anyway, those were the stats. So I was, I was not always convinced, but I spoke to some people who knew about this case, and they insisted that it was like an emotion. The haunting existed as a kind of alien emotion that stole over you and crept over you and that wasn't your emotion and that there was a real resentment and hostility to men and a real regard regarding of men as contemptuous and that i thought was really quite interesting i like this idea of of an intelligent emotion as a haunting i just wish it'd be a slightly more benign one like romantic love or a desire to give puppy dogs treats or <laughs> something useful i don't know i'm talking nonsense as well well funnily enough it's the, the perfect moment to to bring in paulino from over there in rhode island in the united states uh, do you guys know each other by the way um cj and paul oh you i'm afraid you, not oh you you need to you need to uh cj is um is very similar to you in the sense of being a ghost hunter for many many years um, and he has very, very similar models to you in, in many ways. But very quickly, just for the audience, can you just very quickly introduce yourself to say who you are? I know who you are and the rest of us do, but just very quickly. Yeah. Well, Paul Eno, just one spelled backwards. I started uh, researching the paranormal in 1970 when I was studying for the priesthood. And that did me in. They threw me the heck out uh, seven years later. They didn't like any of this. I work today with my son, Ben, who unfortunately couldn't join us. He has tickets to the Boston Celtics basketball game. I myself am a Chiefs fan, Exeter Chiefs. And uh, in any case, well, um, here, I, here I am, and it's wonderful to see you, Tony, and uh, CJ and Emma as well. And um, today we specialize in, I guess you'd call them window areas or flap areas and crossover phenomena. And we just finished our own show. Uh, here on a, in the Boston area, so uh, that's why I'm late. Uh, it's no problem at all, because one of the things, because Emma and I were discussing about your work and your writings, and Emma was saying how much she loves your books, and so do I. I mean, I think they're absolutely extraordinary. And one of the, um, one of the stories I know we've discussed before on previous interviews, but I still think that probably CJ might find this fascinating if he doesn't know about this. If you can tell us the story of, um, well, there's two things. There's the trapped children that you mentioned and also the 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 community where you had the wheel wheel tracks and yes. everything else the sound effects so you just explain those two because they're both extraordinary stories and any other ones that you want to because cj could be really interested in this and could add some very interesting angles to it well i'll take the second one first because that that was my first field case 1970 to 1972 and as a seminary student a good good catholic kid I was thinking, gee, I wonder if, the, if these ghosts we hear about are not souls in purgatory. Maybe that was the origin of that, of that particular doctrine. And that's where I was at the time. Well, uh, I found a case in the newspaper, in the, the Hartford, Connecticut newspaper uh, that year, and I, I tracked it all down. And there was an old man who had a, an old 1948 camera, and he would get photographs in this now abandoned village area that had become second growth woodland, <clears throat> excuse me. And he had um, uh, taken a lot of strange pictures with strange lights, things of that kind. So I tracked him down, he was a local historian and I and several of my seminary classmates went to, to this area. And by the time we finished the preliminaries it was August, 1971. And we walked into this place 
And immediately you would hear the sounds of life or somebody else. Uh, farm implements banging together. There were all sorts of bizarre uh, conversations going on. It seemed like uh, we couldn't see these people, but they were there. Long story short, I began to think that uh, we weren't dealing so much with purgatory or dead people at all, but maybe more with time. Mm -hmm. And uh, the ox cart incident you mentioned was on a, on a subsequent trip in the fall of that year. And seven of us stood there and we heard an ox cart coming down the path. And we, we got out of the way because it sounded so real. And when it came by, it was about 20 feet away. We couldn't see it. And we could hear the wooden wheels, the hoof beats or whatever it was, and a man yelling, yeah, and the crack of a whip. And uh, many years later, I found out that I, I am related, you know, with Eno's or an old Connecticut family out of originally Devon and Somerset and, and uh, Lincolnshire. And uh, good grief. I mean, I. I said, gee, uh, if I could have interacted with this chap, I would have, uh, he would have had a very interesting day. Uh, name was Randall. So uh, I've never had a good chance to go back there and check that. But I came to the, the conclusion that we're probably dealing more with time than we are with death. Nobody was dead here. I don't think the darn thing even exists, death as we understand. And Anthony, you and I have exchanged mm. a lot of ideas on this. So that was that. Uh, the other case uh, you referred to was in Canada in 1979. I was doing a lot of traveling and I had a friend in the Canadian army who uh, had friends who were living in a new subdivision outside of Ottawa. And they said a lot of strange things are going on. The little boy came running up the stairs one day, they had one child. And he was <clears throat> saying that uh, there were children in the basement. and. Uh, the parents said, well, I don't know where that came from, but they said they went down and they saw children underneath the stairs who were in almost uh, maybe jumpsuits to be eight or 10 years old. And uh, they were shouting as if that they could see the people who lived in the house, but they couldn't hear them. Now, I didn't witness this myself. I, I investigated later on and I get testimony of the parents and, and that sort of thing. But uh, this happened on several occasions. So uh, again, it struck me as kind of a parallel world sort of thing rather than dead people. Uh, and here is, it was the end of the seventies and I was very confused because I was running into people who were seeing ghosts of themselves, uh, mm -hmm. people who were seeing phantom buildings and things of this kind that were there the next day. And I said, this is a lot more than dead people. So th those are those those particular stories as well. Well, immediately, uh, I was going to just very quickly say yeah. to uh, very much a link between you two, because I'm sure CJ will know about this case. I'm, I'm absolutely 100 percent sure. But, you know, it's the famous Suffolk case of uh, the Green Children of Woolpit. Oh, and yeah. When I heard that story, that was the immediate thing I thought about was these you know, two children's if they'd been transposed from somewhere else. And this kind of, I think your point is a really valid one, that it's time that is the issue here and parallel existences. I mean, CJ, would you like to come in on that? And Yeah, I mean, the green children, it's something that happened so long ago that it's, I, I, I think of it every time I think of it, I think of Caroline, who's the green counsellor these days for for Woolpit and has two children who I refer to as the green children of Woolpit. <laughs> I don't think that any of them are actually pleased about my my jokes, but anyway. Nor are they green. I know Woolpit very well indeed. Uh, my sister lives just on the edge of it. And it is, it's a very strange case, but I'm not going to speculate too much because it happened, what, 700 years ago now? Eight, nearly 800 years ago. So it's one of those bizarre cases that, is however incredibly well known um for those who don't know a small boy and girl with green skin who say that they come from st martin's land a land where it's always um twilight appear and they turn up and they are taken in by a local knight who many skeptics have claimed doesn't exist but i spent quite a lot of time a couple of years ago with the victoria county history and I'm pretty sure we found him. We know who he was. I mean, he did exist. There was 
there was an individual. The story does appear to have some foundation in fact. Um, a lot of the dismissals of it are rather unfair, actually. But I think where we agree very strongly, though, and much, much closer, I agree totally with Paul, because as far back as 1894, when the SPR did their huge census of hallucinations where they were looking for ghosts and they were asking people about their ghost experiences, they had reports of ghostly buildings. They had reports of um, hauntings, which did not feature anyone who was dead. And in fact, the majority of cases in the SPR research where the identity of the apparition was known, where they knew who the spook was, that person was alive and well. They weren't even a crisis apparition. They weren't even, you know, it wasn't they'd fallen down the well and needed rescuing when their ghost appeared. They were alive and well and somewhere else at the time. But they appeared and they appeared solid and they appeared to witnesses. And another thing about those um, 1894 cases was about 25% of those that took place in daylight had multiple witnesses. So, you know, there was quite a large number of people, of ghosts, which were seen by multiple people, as in Paul's experience. But the whole notion that ghosts are the dead is problematic and always has been. Now, in 1990, um, Donald West, in 1970, um, Celia Green repeat, repeated some of that research. And in 1990, Donald West did. And in 2012, Becky did, uh, Becky Smith. And they all found the same pattern. The only difference is that as time goes on, more ghosts are of dead people when they're identified and less are of living people. And I think that's partly for two reasons. One, there's a technological shift. So we now know what our grandparents looked like. We now are able to look up and identify people who died 100 years ago much more readily and with the Internet much more easily. So if Paul was looking up his ancestor, Randall, or was looking back into the past, he would be able to find it much easier than if the experience, the experience when it happened in 1970 or 71. Nowadays, in 2020, it's it's almost trivially easy to find photos of people who lived before us. But the other reason, um, there's two more reasons. The, another, the second reason is that if I was dying and I was trying to reach out and send a message to Emma and Anthony, uh, I would pick up a mobile phone and call them. And if I died, uh, Becky would probably post on Facebook, CJ's dead, whoop de doo party tonight, uh, all welcome, you know, bring a bottle. Um, to celebrate my sudden demise. That's my partner. But, you know, everybody would know within an hour there wouldn't be much time for me or much need for me to manifest to relatives in distant areas or to let my loved ones know because everybody would be fully aware very quickly because we have telephones, we pick them up. When my father died, the first thing my mother said was pretty much, can you tell your sisters? So I had to phone around. And, yeah. And uh, there was a third reason I've completely forgot. Oh, yeah. The third reason is that when you're doing research of the type we were doing, where you're asking people about their experiences rather than actually going out and experiencing it firsthand, those experiences are usually uh, when you say to someone, have you seen a ghost or have you had an experience like a ghost? They think about dead people. They don't think about the time they saw their uncle walking in through the back door, coming in, putting his shoes down on the table. And then they went in and 10 minutes later, he walked in and they said, where did you go? And he said, what do you mean? I've only just come home, which is a very common experience that happens to a lot of people. Um, it's surprising how often we have we see people before they arrive. The Norwegians have a term for it, uh, Vardugula or something like that, but we don't. So. So having just rambled on <laughs> at great length about theoretical reasons as to why we might now get more reports of dead people than we did. 100 years ago, I think the, the phenomena is the same. You mentioned Bradfield St George, just down the road from Bradfield. If you leave Bradfield and take the road to Ruffham Green, it's about a mile down a lovely lane. There's not a lot down there apart from a few cows, coos. And as you're driving along or riding along, it's said that on the left hand side, it's you might suddenly see a large house. And this is a beautiful Georgian house with dormer windows. It's got elaborate floral gardens, flower gardens. And over the decades, it's been seen by probably two dozen witnesses, maybe more. And these are the ones who've reported it. And when they see the house, it's, they're normally slightly surprised and don't remember having ever seen a house there before. 
and sometimes they stop sometimes they try and drive up to it sometimes they just drive on but the important thing is that the house vanishes and suddenly it's not there anymore and when I was young, about the age of 20, I was a theology student. They hadn't chucked me out at that time. I think we were all theology students at some time. It seems to be <laughs> what we would do. And uh, I was at a small church college. And one summer, my friend, Dave the Munchkin, who smoked dope and looked like a bit like Shaggy from Scooby-Doo, persuaded me that we should go over to the location, which was only a few miles from my house on the other side of the country, and we should attempt to look for the remains of this house. So we went there and we walked up through an avenue of trees and we walked around in a field and we picked up bits of tile and we picked up some bits of brick. But we'd looked on the maps and we'd not found anything. And the problem is that maps before 1815 in England are actually very good. They're kind of rather diagrammatic rather than actual accurate you know they're kind of symbolic maps they, there's a family coat of arms which means there might have been a house of the de Courcys or whoever over there and maybe the Blenkinsops are over there but you within 10 miles who knows where they live so we just wandered around the field trying to find out what we could and looking at the archaeology and as we were walking back through the trees we suddenly had a rather strange experience because in the story there are these great elaborate gateposts with um, lions or similar heraldic devices on top and you've got the gates and then you've got a yellow wall and then there's an avenue of trees that goes up to the house so the house and I suddenly noticed that the trees on either side there was a kind of bank on either side and the trees that were standing just inside the bank were five times larger than the trees in the middle of the wood and the trees in between them and we realized that what we were actually seeing was an avenue that had grown in so if you imagine the oldest trees are the original trees from the avenue. So we went and we hacked away desperately. And sure enough, there we found the other side of the trees, the remains of a yellow brick wall. Mm. And uh, digging down, we found that we were walking along what was once a uh, graveled drive leading up to no doubt a house. So there was plenty of archaeological evidence that are building. And subsequently, we found evidence on photographs from aerial photographs that show the outlines of ponds and what appear to be outbuildings and stru a structure, but it's been heavily ploughed. So there you go. The disappearing house appears to have a real physical footprint. And again, that would suggest, Paul, would you like to take over, Paul? Because I think that to me suggests very much a time slip phenomena rather than a spiritual phenomena, if you like. Yes, uh, agreed. Uh, probably the equivalent to a case that I have had uh, CJ is uh, was in Vermont in uh, 1974 or 75. Can't quite remember which, but I had just been through that this this terrible poltergeist case in Bridgeport, Bridgeport, Connecticut, with Ed and Lorraine Warren, which uh, knocked my socks off to say the least. And yeah. uh, I was in Vermont. That that's the the diocese I was studying for the priesthood for. My mm -hmm. boss, uh, Bishop Marshall in Burlington. I was not in his good books. But I visited a friend near uh, Enosburg, Vermont, named after one of my <laughs> relatives. And uh, two fellas drove up in a pickup truck and they were surveyors. And they were telling about how they'd been down in, in Johnson, Vermont, in, in the mountains there, such as we have, and uh, had encountered a house while they were surveying that was very strange didn't look, look as though it was painted, didn't have any, any electrical wires or phone wires running to or from it, had uh, clothing hanging on a line, and uh, no vehicles of any kind. And there was a man with an axe over his shoulder, and they, they went down into the road to, because it, it wasn't on the map, this house, and they shouted to him, and he kind of looked as if he heard something, but it was as though he couldn't see them. So they went back uh, to finish the survey and the house was gone. And it turned out that uh, according to town records it had burned down in 1910. So wow. very bizarre. And they took me out there and there were um, certain plants that, that grow in this area, you know, after fires, things of that kind. But yeah, one of the things that maybe to add a little, uh, layer another layer to this, CJ. You might want to comment. And Emma, you, you, you're not. 
I'm sorry, Anthony, I'm used to being a show host. Myself. Oh, no, no, this is the point of the show. This is the point okay. of the show. Uh, is that, um, and I'm thinking of the Randall relatives, uh, there was a case, ben and I, we work on cases for years. The longest <laughs> running case we have now is from 2005 and we're still working on it, it keeps growing. Wow. And it's what we refer to as a flap area case in Connecticut. And now it's over into the Hudson Valley of New York State. And the original house, uh, in, in the course of all these years, we found out we're distant cousins because her maiden name was Randall. Uh, the house had been occupied by the same family uh, for six generations, which is pretty respectable for this country. Uh, yep. Not unusual in the UK. But uh, there had been uh, a time in the, I believe it was the 1920s, when the great grandparents of the current owner uh, lived in an apartment in the cellar for some reason. And the, the, uh, the ghosts, quote unquote, of the people who were living in the cellar apparently were the grandparents, the great grandparents. And uh, with our particular point of view on ghosts, but they were, Ben and I went down and, and I went into a meditative state, a long story, and uh, encountered them they were afraid of us and of their descendants because they thought they were ghosts haunting them. They were just going about their lives. So, you know, we assume these are dead people, but when you look at it more deeply, it turns out to be uh, something in our opinion and experience quite different. So we literally had to talk them through it so that they wouldn't be afraid of the people living upstairs who they thought were ghosts. So I mean, we, we run into that very frequently. And when you're open to that idea, you tend to run into it. You know, so mm -hmm. I think we're correct about that. One of the stories that um, really fascinated me was, and it was it was told to, to, to me and a group of others by a very, very famous British writer uh, who I will not name purely simply because it's not fair to do so. And he was telling it, what it was, was we were at a, a scientific and medical network event. And it was the evening after we'd, we'd had a, an annual general meeting. And everybody wanted to do a little bit of a turn or a bit of an act of the weirdest thing that they'd ever been involved in that they'd never been able to explain. And this guy said, I've written many, many books, but I've never, ever written about this because it is so extraordinary that I cannot explain it. And he said that he was traveling again in the, the Suffolk area. It always seems to be Suffolk. I don't know why it is. <laughs> Suffolk is weird. And no is. <laughs> he was traveling in Suffolk and he got lost. I don't know why the, the, the car got lost. And it was before sat nav. It was many, many years ago. And he couldn't find where he was. And he got worried about his wife was going to be worried about him and because she was in the audience. So she was aware of the story and vindicated it. So he gets really desperate and then he looks, parks the car and looks up. And in the middle of a field, he spots a red telephone box. And he thinks that's really weird. A red telephone box. What on earth is a red telephone box doing in the middle of a field? So he goes over to the red telephone box, picks up the receiver to discover it's working. So he dials his wife and tells her that he's OK. He's got a little bit lost, but he's going to be home OK. And he puts the phone down, goes back to the car, drives, finds the route and goes back home. And he gets home and he said, I've just thought about it. What would a telephone box be in the middle of a field? So they took themselves off the next day to find the telephone box. And it wasn't there. And they couldn't find it anywhere, even though they knew it was in that area. Now, the question he said here was, if it was a phantom telephone box, I can understand that. But it worked. And I phoned you up <laughs> from it. And he said, that is such a bizarre story that I've never, ever put it in any of my books. Now, the question then is, that really starts to make your brain really twist, doesn't it? Because this is, and again, is it parallel worlds? And was there another alternate universe that he was able to engender or create? to bring into creation because he desperately needed it in one way yeah. or another. That's like that famous, the famous time slip story though from the eighties. Go that on. Is, it isn't as extraordinary as it was. It was put on, do you remember that? My class will show Strange But True. Oh, and they, yeah, they, they, they did a version of it, which wasn't exactly what had happened, which was a bit mm. more melodramatic, but it was this couple, these two couples were on holiday in France 
and they when they were driving they were driving there on the holidays and they driving along and they find one of those little nice little French places to stay the night and they stayed the night and they got up in the morning and it was very rustic kind of but this is the 1980s you don't have your phones and you don't expect them and the next morning they get up and they go to pay and it's feeling very and they think oh gosh the gendarme uniforms are a bit old-fashioned a bit more like the hello hello ones than the ones we've seen in the cities and they pay and it's unusually cheap but again they're thinking and they the guy makes a fuss about the money but then lets them go and they go on their way and then on the way back because they're doing one of those drives down France and back they say well let's slay that place because it was cheap again but they couldn't find it on the way back and then they and so but then they 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 the only they kind of came to the explanation it was some sort of time slip and there are loads more details to this story that I'm not fully, but it's it's fascinating. I think they apparently allegedly they couldn't get their pictures developed. Mm. Yeah, um, no, is, one of the couples spoke on on the program, and the other weren't available. But there is, I spent a bit of time recently on Google Maps, going on the route they were, trying to work out if they were on a parallel road or something. Yeah, because but, I, yeah. that was that was my immediate reaction. I found the I found the details of it. I'm trying to remember where I found it. It might be in an old SPR journal. I think Jenny thinks they're legit. Jenny Randall thinks they're legit, and she tends to be quite down to earth. Yes, if Jenny, and I, knows, I, yeah, she's, she, you know, she's 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 not easily swayed, and it's she, no, she's not. She's not, and I, um, it's really fun. But there was it. There's a lot of stuff that was a bit nonsensey on the Strange but True program, and they've complained about what happened to their story. I've seen. I wish I could remember where, but I've seen things. It's going to drive me nuts now until I see where I saw where they were talking about it but um yeah but that was very much that sort of thing of that they had this interaction with whatever was happening again could have been a parallel road <laughs> but well um, the 40 uh, times have an index sorry the 40 and times is there an index for it no they're in the process of indexing it are they that's brilliant because that's, yeah. that's, that's what we need great yeah. sorry paul you were going to say yeah oh no just uh, the, probably the, the weirdest uh, situation of that kind that I've run into. Uh, I was, uh, it was in the 1980s, I was lecturing in Providence, Rhode Island, not far from where I live, and a woman came up uh, and had notes about a very strange occurrence that, it, that uh, they had experienced uh, in the state of Utah, you know, way out west, and it's uh, largely uh, barren country, that sort of thing. And she said that she and her husband who, who uh, were, and I interviewed her in depth, uh, she had been in a real estate and he, he was a banker. So that, you know, these were presumably very reliable people and they were elderly. They had a great interest in ghost towns as they're called, you know, abandoned, uh, particularly in the West uh, places that are no longer occupied. And they had been staying at a hotel in, in one of the cities and that they were explaining to someone there who uh, that they were going to go visit a, a, a one of these ghost towns and he said well you know you're really not going to find anything there's, not, there's nothing there but they said maybe there are some artifacts so, so they drove all the way out there and all of a sudden they came to a sign that was it said welcome in not welcome it was like a, a, a different language and uh, they drove <laughs> into the town which was quite active but they said the cars looked very strange and they, they were in this bright red uh, sort of um, uh, minivan sort of thing. And uh, it attracted a lot of attention as they drove down the street. They went into a restaurant uh, and the menu was in a foreign language. They later found out it was Dutch. And uh, the, they um, ordered by using the pictures. And uh, the, the, the proprietor, who was also the waiter, didn't really understand what they were saying but you know they they ordered and they said sandwiches were good but they were very cheap and uh, they handed and the, the fellow act as though he'd never seen american money before and uh but he took it the coins and uh they went out and people were gathered around their vehicles sort of staring at it and they thought this is too creepy so they got it and they drove out and uh, of course this was the location of the abandoned town and what people were doing in Utah, speaking Dutch and driving weird vehicles, I mean, they never you know, worked out what 
could have been going on. So that that's probably the weird. And again, I, I usually write about cases I see myself, uh, but uh, this is probably the strangest one I've run into. Indeed. Plus, Go on, CJ, please. Surprised they're not speaking Danish. The reason being that Utah was um, late 19th century and during the early phases of the Mormon period, it was very heavily um, visited by Danes. And I didn't know that. And Danish and Dutch are very different languages, but Velkommen would be the same in both. Yeah, as okay. well in Danish and in and I think that yeah, that there, there was a there were Danish speaking towns in Utah, and they some of them no longer exist simply because they clashed with the Last Day Saints. Uh, there mm. was. A, almost a war between the, the, the Danish settlers and the Latter-day Saints, and some of them became Latter-day Saints, and most of them eventually moved on to other parts of the United States. But Texas, for example, still has a, a, a large Danish population. Um, one of my cousins was Miss Texas, which is something quite oh, horrifying really? to think about. Hopefully that beauty <laughs> is genetic, because otherwise Texans have problems. But <laughs> look at the eyebrows. But there you go. Yeah. But yeah, Dane, it sounds to me like a, they could have encountered a early 20th century, late 19th century Danish-speaking community in Utah. If you were able Very to give me any, that was the location, I could look it up easily. But in Danish. Well, I'll region. communicate that. Yeah, the, thank you, CJ. You know more about it than I do. I don't the just Dutch, have to be Danish. That's an advantage. The Dutch community is in Michigan. As a matter of fact, uh, King Willem Alexander recently visited uh, Michigan and was talking about that. And he said, I heard a, a saying here. His English is excellent, as you know. If it ain't Dutch, it ain't much. So <laughs> in any case, uh, whether it was Dutch or Danish, uh, there we have it. Well, I have to say that um, some of the, I'd, I'd had some quite extraordinary experiences when I've been in Utah. Um, I find it a very, particularly southern Utah, uh, I find it a very, very Ouch. strange place. <laughs> You've fallen off your shirt. Yeah, no, no, I've been watching the ranches, of course. <laughs> <laughs> weird english people um sorry and danish people yeah but i found that there was something kind of very strange about the place very very atmospheric i mean particularly around the the um uh the the, the old mesas that you have down there as well there's mm. something extraordinary but then again it's more just a feeling of atmosphere now one of the things paul that we were discussing earlier on with the group with um with Samantha and with um, with uh, Jeremy was again something that um, CJ really expanded upon, which was a fascinating area. We were discussing about the continuity of personality and the idea that are we continually the same person? And indeed, rather like, you know, there's time slips in terms of ghosts and time slips, but also the idea of possession, the idea of mediumship, the idea of, of, of fleeting personalities sort of dropping in and out of our own consciousnesses you know as if there's a consciousness field out there and entities can just come in in many ways now in my in my book the hidden universe i was particularly as you know i was fascinated by your work in terms of entities and plasma because the first theme we were discussing about was about orbs and i remember you telling me that fascinating story that you were telling where you'd seen orbs manifesting around electrical substations or around electrical units. And I'd just like to sort of, for the last um, 10, 15 minutes of the show, really zoom in on this because it's an area we touched upon earlier on. And I know that you're the guy that stimulated me to come up with my own egregorial idea, the own idea of the way in which plasma may be related because there's the idea of the gin being made out of smokeless fire. And this mm -hmm. kind of thing. So can you expand a little bit about on that? Because your hypothesis here is extraordinary. Well, one of the uh, the many concepts that, that and again, you know, I, I didn't learn this at a classroom. These are things I've experienced and been to, and we interpret it according to that. And we, we bring in physicists and stuff to sort of evaluate and they disagree, et cetera. But um, it, it appears to us that we are uh, dealing with uh, what physicists refer to, refer to as membranes or brains, B-R-A-N-E-S, mm -hmm. and that uh, they are essentially electromagnetically charged and, and you've got uh, plasma boundaries between apparently different worlds with different laws of physics. Now it's much more complex than that, 
But essentially, uh, why did those people in the cellar, who were presumably in a world where it was in the 1920 or so, see us and see their own descendants as ghosts? Well, because they'd be looking through this boundary and you'd see glowing figures or, you know, the, the classical ghost. And the, you assume it must be dead. You know, what else could it be? Uh, they weren't necessarily up on their quantum mechanics or things of this kind. But the plasma seems to be something that, that is present in many, and we, we, we're talking about Jenny Randall's, and we have tremendous respect for her time storms mm, great concept. Cool. Yes, and uh, yeah, it's hard to find, but we I had a copy when it came out, fortunately. And we we've looked back on our cases and seen uh, what could be plasma phenomena associated with that sort of thing. Uh, I think of uh, speaking of the case where we had the the, the wagon wheels and everything else in Pomfret, Connecticut, nineteen seventy that, that we were talking about. There was an incident on the second trip there. Uh, and we brought a man who was an engineer who didn't believe a word of this, complete unbeliever. And, he, and he's the one to whom all the really bizarre things happen. And uh, one of these was uh, as we were walking up toward the cemetery, and I refer to this as the mutterers. We encountered the mutterers. Uh, we were very familiar with where the, the cemetery was, a little cemetery where the people who had lived there were buried, and uh, it was gone on this particular night. We had um, uh, spotlights, things, and we mapped it very well. And uh, he had an experience that um, where he stopped and he was he was rooted to the ground, almost as if it was an electrical phenomenon where, where that can happen if you're standing in water particularly. But he could move voluntarily back and to the right away from the cemetery. Now, there were all sorts of phenomena uh, that are associated with time storms, as Jenny calls them. And in this case, there was uh, a, a thunderstorm going on, or at least lightning, uh, a relatively short distance away, which was unusual for the time of year. It was November. And uh, there, are, there are many meteorological and plasma-like phenomena that, that that can be affected by lightning up to one or 200 miles away, as she says in her, in her book. And uh, when, when we looked at that and looked back on it, these things were happening at the height of this lightning. And again, it wasn't near us, it was, it was off to the east, but nevertheless, it, you could feel kind of electrical charge in the air. And many of the things we saw were almost like cloud-like, plasma-like substances of that kind, uh, when we, um, when when he had doubled over in, in in sobbing, he had to know this guy. He didn't do this sort of thing. Onto his walking stick, uh, he was suddenly um, felt felt as though later on he said that he was being possessed, you know, and, and not in a negative sense, but in the sense of some, something was trying to speak through him. And at that point, we heard these low voices. Uh, maybe about 20 feet off to our left in the direction of what would have been the cemetery, uh, muttering. And, you know, it's, it's uh, you, you can, you know, you, you hear a group of voices, you know it's in English, but you really can't make it out. And uh, that was happening there. And I wondered, uh, all things being equal, if this was a time storm situation, if uh, we were not ghosts to them, because from day one in the late 1700s, this cemetery was, was reputedly haunted. Before anybody was even buried there, were we attending uh, through the plasma screen, so to speak, the first burial at that cemetery? Were we the first ghosts? <laughs> and I think when you take the, 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 the time storm thing right to its logical or illogical conclusion, that they, that could be could have been the case. Maybe we started the whole haunting we were investigating. That is absolutely extraordinary. And, and funnily enough, I mean, one of the things, Jenny Randalls comes from the same part of the UK as I do. Um, and uh, she very much, a lot of her time storms stories are based upon things that happened on the Wirral and in Merseyside, which is which is quite a, an interesting area in many, many ways. Mm -hmm. um, not quite as strange as Suffolk. Nowhere is quite as strange as Suffolk and CJ's. 
Um, but nevertheless, you know, it is intriguing. And I would love at some stage to get Jenny on this show. I mean, I keep meaning to do so. And I keep love to get her on our show, too. I know, because you were trying to you. I, I was hoping to try and facilitate contact for you. And I'll still try and do that if I can. Um, Thank you. CJ, what is your um, what's your what's your take on that? Because I know you will have one. It will be an extraordinary. Uh, I'm, sure I'm now sitting on the floor because my chair broke. <laughs> <laughs> it's, the it's, it's the archons. It's the archons. Top of a hat. So yeah, <laughs> I thought it was absolutely fascinating. And I think the notion that, you know, you are the ghost, that the ghost is the investigator, is it, it makes so much sense, doesn't it? If you are. I had a really weird experience myself when I was just a teenager. You're going to guess it took place in Bury St. Edmunds in Suffolk, aren't you? I can, yes. I was actually I was in the sixth form uh, with my friend Hugh Wake, who still kicks around with me nowadays. And the two of us had gone out at lunchtime to buy some aniseed balls to throw at my dog because he liked them, and uh, to buy some tuna sandwiches because why not? And I don't think we were in any great hurry to get back to school because it was a sixth form day and we didn't have lessons all the time. We were supposed to go to the library and study, etc. So we were strolling around. It was a beautiful sunny day and we walked down and we were walking down the side of the cathedral and suddenly I saw a crocodile of school children coming from St James Middle School. They would have been about nine to 12 years old and I thought absolutely nothing of it. I'd been to that school a few years before. I was six years older and here for some reason I walked down sort of stood up to one side to let them go past and I can't remember what he was doing. It was something ridiculous, like doing his shoelace or just hanging back to let people go by. And as I looked up, I suddenly saw myself. And I realised that I was watching from a different perspective my own um, school going past, my own class, as it had been years before. And I was really shaken. So I turned around to Hugh and said, Hugh, Hugh, did you see that? And he said, what? And I said, the school children. And he said, no. And I thought, well, there's just been, you know, 60 school children walk past you. How could you have missed it? But he just looked at me like I was a bit odd. And I came over really queasy. And the absolute horrible thing was, I mean, I didn't watch Doctor Who as a child, but this is very Doctor Who. I was by this time a long haired, scruffy hippie with a tie dyed shirt. And at 12, I was definitely a little fascist. I mean, I was a perfectionist. I was terribly neat and tidy. I disapproved of people. I certainly disapproved of bloody hippies. And I had this feeling that if I'd seen what I was going to turn into, and if the 12-year-old me had recognised the 18-year-old me, he would make definite, definite life choices, which would cause me to cease to exist. So I was deeply concerned. So I try and explain my, my, my fear that I've just seen myself to him, who says, it's a doppelganger. Don't worry, it's just a death omen. It probably means you'll be dead before tomorrow. <laughs> and the two of us, like, you know, we, we, we're 18. So we start to walk back, and I'm complaining about the fact that I'm going to cease to exist and turn into someone else. And who is saying to me, you do look a bit strange, actually. I think you're going to be ill. It's definitely, it's, it's always a sign of impending death. So he said, I'll pop it until your grandmother so she can break it to the rest of the family. And I was like, bastard, because he's like, you know, mocking me, but also half serious. Anyway, I go into an English class and I'm sitting there and I have a lovely English teacher, a wonderful woman who comes over and says, Christian, are you unwell? And at that point, I vomited all over her. And I'll never forget because she was wearing pixie boots in the 80s style and black trousers and a blouse. And I just threw up all over her. And she immediately said, you know, well, A, she needed to leave the room and clean herself up. But B, she said, you're really not well. You need to go home now. And I think she assumed that me and who had just been down the market tavern drinking beer. But in reality, all it was, was I got home and I had this terrible pain, like somebody hammering a spike through my head. And for the next three or four days, I was really unwell. The doctor came out and it turned out I had a migraine. And I've never had a migraine before or since. But I was reading a couple of years ago a book uh, called Hallucinations by uh, Sachs, the chap who wrote The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat in which he talks about migraine and talks about how one of the more unusual phenomena associated with migraine is people hallucinating seeing themselves at other stages in their life. Mm. 
doppelgangers. So there you go. It's it's a ridiculous story. It's a fairly pointless story because I'm sure it was just a migraine, but I thought I would share it. And strangely enough, I didn't disappear, and nor did I suddenly become neat, tidy, and organised again. Twelve year old me is still very disappointed, but. That is so profoundly important because we're coming towards the end now. And I think that was the perfect ending to the discussion in many ways. But you probably have not uh, read my book, Opening the Doors of Perception. Um, but in it there, I have something I call the Huxley and Spectrum. And I'm a classic migrainer myself. Um, and I argue that, you know, there's a continuum be uh, from uh, neurotypicals to classic migrainers, to people who experience temporal lobe epilepsy right the way through. And the doors of perception are getting more and more open. And one of the things that has long intrigued me about migraines is this these reports of doppelgangers or more technically hoitoscopy, I think it is, whereby you, you see an image of yourself in front of yourself. Uh, and I know that this is a consistent part. I've never, never had it in my migraine or estates. Um, but nevertheless, there is this feeling of duplicity in some way. But I love the time slip there. It's almost again going back to, isn't it, the long lingus area, the long body, the idea of experiencing all of yourselves as a continuum of a long kind of creature that's like a snake that um, we're just parts of it. Um, I am aware of the time and all I'd like to do is to thank everybody for their involvement um, it's been absolutely extraordinary. We have to do this again. I really genuinely mean this because we could go on for hours just on associations and everything else as well. It's profoundly important. And I'm also delighted to have facilitated contact between Paul and CJ because the two of the, those two guys, you know, the, the stories they have and the experiences they've had would be incredible. And putting the two together maybe this is the kind of reason why this show was here because i'm sure that you put the those two guys together you're going to con con have something absolutely extraordinary and emma as always thank you very much for being involved and thanks again to samantha Lee treasure who who was involved with us earlier and uh, and dr jeremy uh jeremy weiss as well for his input it's been simply sensational um this will be uploaded on well it will be automatically uploaded onto my youtube channel um as soon as we finish this show um and i unfortunately i haven't been able to work the software possibly to actually check any comments that were in the comments section because i was flying without without sarah who's normally the person that's why my wing wing lady wing person or whatever we want to call it uh, so i've been trying to do it on my own so if I've been looking away. This is because I've been checking what's been happening in various ways. But anyway, thanks everybody for being involved. Um, if any, if any of any of you now want to just say quickly if anybody can contact you, if you have contact details, Emma, is there? there you have you contact details at all? Uh, my contact details are probably best Facebook or my email, as usual, is Emma at emmamcneil.co.uk. Okay, wonderful. Paul, contact details and everything else. Well, the website behind theparanormal.com wonderful and those shows are, those shows are extraordinary excluding I think I, have Pardon? I think I have trick or treaters that's the noise behind me apologies oh I see okay I was going to say with Paul's show all his shows are exceptionally good with the possible exception of the ones I've been on but no no just the opposite <laughs> thank you thank you um and uh, CJ uh, your details uh, yeah, firstly, anyone who wants to donate a chair can send it to us at <laughs> www.asap.ac.uk. That's www.asap.ac.uk. Or if you just Google CJ plus Ghost Hunter or CJ plus Old Fat and Bald, you will almost certainly find me. Those search terms invariably work. Have a good night. Thank you very much. I'm going to have to dash because I've got okay, the AGM now. So okay, thanks, CJ. good night Andrew. all. Okay, Take see care. You. And ju just just to let you know that I'm a member of ASSAP as well, and Samantha Lee Treasure is as well. Uh, and it's it's an organisation that I really strongly advise that you you consider at least checking out. Um, they do some wonderful conferences, magazines, and everything else as well. Um, and going forward, I want to try and get more involved in it as well because I'm such an admirer. Of, of CJ. He is 
an extraordinary human being. And I think that came across there as well, as of course you are, Paul, and as you are as well, Emma. Okay, well, thanks very much. And thanks for spending time with us. We could go on for another two hours quite easily. Um, but of course, we'd probably send everybody else to sleep, but we keep talking anyway, which is wonderful. So again, thanks, everybody. And thank you again, everybody for listening in. And Emma, again, thank you for joining us from Northern okay, Ireland yeah. and Paul over there from uh, New England. Thank you very much. Thank you. And bye. bye.